Okay, hi everyone. Uh, this is a lecture for Biochemistry 470, and the title of today's lecture is The Carbon Cycle Part 2. So for our lecture outline today, we are going to start by defining the global methane cycle. Uh, we'll also identify some anthropogenic sources of methane emissions and discuss methane as a greenhouse gas. And then we'll compare three uh, biochemical pathways that are used for methane production, which is also known as methanogenesis. Okay, so as we can see here, uh, the kind of chemical structure or uh, chemical formula of methane is CH4. So kind of significantly, uh, methane contains carbon uh, in its most reduced form. Uh, under most conditions, methane is a colorless, odorless gas. And it's significant in relation to the carbon cycle because methane is the second most abundant uh, carbon-containing gas uh, in the atmosphere. So if you look at this uh, table here, which lists uh, all of the uh, gas constituents of the atmosphere, we can see that carbon dioxide is listed as having a concentration of 360 parts per million. Uh, this data is actually a little bit uh, old. We know that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is now uh, about 410 parts per million. But kind of importantly here, we can see that the concentration of methane is much less. So listed here as uh, 1.5 ppm. So more than 200 fold less than carbon dioxide, but it's still the most uh, second most abundant carbon containing gas uh, in the atmosphere. And so in relation to the carbon cycle, methane is a really significant gas. Uh, it's a significant gas because it's a greenhouse gas um, and it actually has a, a higher global warming potential uh, as compared to CO2. Okay, so we define the global methane cycle uh, as being kind of a sub-cycle of the carbon cycle that describes the fl flux of methane uh, between various uh, reservoirs on Earth. And if we consider these, these reservoirs of methane, sort of the three most abundant methane reservoirs are ocean hydrates, permafrost hydrates, and gas reserves. So if we look over at this uh, figure here on the, the left, which describes kind of the global methane cycle, so over here on the left, we can see that there are various processes that can function to remove methane from the atmosphere. We can have um, methane reacting with uh, hydroxide radicals or chlorine in the atmosphere that functions to remove methane from the atmosphere. Um, and in terrestrial environments, we can also have oxidation of methane by um, methanotrophic bacteria also functioning to, to remove um, a methane from, from the atmosphere or from the air. And then sort of in the middle here, we can see a number of processes that um, function to emit methane. And kind of importantly, uh, the arrows that are uh, black indicate uh, natural fluxes or natural processes, and the arrows that are red uh, indicate sort of anthropogenic processes or fluxes. And then this arrow here that's kind of yellow or brown represents a process that's both anthropogenic as well as uh, naturally driven. So we, in terms of methane emissions, we can see that we can have uh, methane um, emitted from uh, ocean hydrates. We also have a lot of methane uh, emitted from agricultural processes, so methane emitted from livestock, um, as well as agricultural processes such as rice cultivation. Uh, we can have methane emitted from water supplies, so from wet, fresh water or uh, wetlands. Also, lots of um, methane emitted from kind of waste sources, so landfills and other sources of waste. Uh, we can also have methane emitted sort of during incomplete combustion of fossil fuels or kind of the burning of biomass. And so kind of importantly here, it's currently thought that about 50% of methane emissions are natural and about 50% of methane emissions are anthropogenic or kind of human driven. Okay, and so if we want to kind of consider methane emissions kind of from a more biological perspective, it's important to recognize that most methane emissions are driven by microbes or microbial processes. So this pie chart here on the left represents kind of total percentage of methane emissions or the total methane budget. And we can see here that sort of everything from kind of wetlands, which is purple, all the way down to sewage treatment here, uh, which is kind of blue, everything sort of here these are all microbial driven processes. So about 70% of all methane emissions are produced by what are known as methanogenic archaea 
or methanogens. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about these uh, metha methanogenic or KR, these methanogens that produce methane. So as I said, these um, organisms are known as methanogens. If we look at this first figure here, which shows kind of our phylogenetic tree of life, uh, of course we have sort of three domains of life. We have bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And methanogens sit within this kind of phylum of archaea on the right here, which are known as um, uriarchaeota. Uh, uri arche uri so it's kind of this uh, right branch here comprises these uh, methanogens. So biological methane production is achieved by species of archaea that are known as methanogens. These methanogens are anaerobic, so they produce um, methane under anaerobic conditions. And they're also obligate methane producers, meaning that they have to produce methane to survive. Uh, there's also over 50 known species of methanogens. They can be either um, cocci or bacilli in shape. And this electron micrograph here um, is showing a culture of uh, methanogens known as uh, Methanobacterium formicicum, uh, which, which, which as we can see here are bacilli. Um, and kind of importantly, these methanogens are found in early diverse environments. So typically where we see methanogens sort of functioning ecologically is they tend to function sort of at the end of anaerobic uh, food chains. So methanogens tend to thrive in environments where other nutrients such as kind of sulfur or nitrogen are limiting and they can sort of function by um, in anaerobic environments kind of completing degradation um, of products produced by other bacteria, uh, particularly kind of fermentation products that are produced by other bacteria or other microbes. And so we're going to sort of continue the lecture by um, covering sort of three pathways, the three primary pathways that are used by methanogens uh, to produce methane or for methanogenesis. So the three pathways uh, are shown here. Uh, the first one on the left is known as the hydrogenotrophic pathway. And in this case, methane is produced from carbon dioxide as well as hydrogen gas or molecular hydrogen. Um, and in this case, CO2 is reduced to methane, and the electrons that are used to reduce uh, CO2 to methane are derived from, from hydrogen. Uh, this central pathway here, which is shown in B, uh, is known as the acetoclastic pathway. And in this case, um, methane is produced from acetate. So in this case, the methyl group within acetate is reduced to methane, and then this carboxyl group within acetate is um, oxidized to CO2. So we can produce uh, methane from acetate within this uh, central pathway. Um, and then the final pathway, which is shown here on, on the right, or in C, is known as the methylotrophic pathway. And in this case, um, some of these archaea, or some of these methanogens, can also produce methane from uh, methanol. So in this case, the methyl group within methanol is reduced to methane, and these uh, archaea sometimes also oxidize this methyl group to CO2, and I'll, I'll talk about sort of these two branches of the pathway uh, a little bit more uh, in, later in the lecture. Uh, but sort of significantly, most methanogens uh, use this hydrogen, hydrogenotrophic pathway. This is thought to be the primary pathway that these methanogens can use uh, to, to produce um, methane. Okay, so kind of looking at these pathways in a little bit uh, more detail. So the first one, this hydrogenotrophic pathway for methane production. So there's several steps within this pathway, and we'll kind of look at each of them uh, individually. So the first step in this pathway is um, reduction of ferrodoxin by uh, molecular hydrogen. And ferrodoxin is an electron carrier. It's used by lots of anaerobic uh, organisms, anaerobic bacteria um, or archaea, as well as uh, a lot of photosynthetic organisms. So we first have reduction of ferrodoxin by molecular hydrogen. And then the second step, which is shown right here, is known as reductive activation of carbon dioxide to form a formal methanofuran. So in this case, we have reduction of CO2 to a formal group. Um, and it's also called um, reductive activation because that formal group is also conjugated to a coenzyme, uh, which is known as methanofuran. 
And so we can sort of look at methanofurin in a little bit more detail here. So at the top, this is the, the structure of this uh, coenzyme methanofurin. Uh, this part over here is 2-aminomethylfuran, and then it's 2-aminomethylfuran uh, oh, here, and then it's uh, conjugated to a phenoxy group. Not terribly important, the structure of this thing, but uh, significantly this amino group here is kind of the functional group where the, the formal group is, is conjugated. So if you look down here at this representation, we can see we have CO2 as well as our methanofuran, and then here's our, our formal group uh, attached right here to the coenzyme. And the dehydrogenase that catalyzes this reaction, a uh, pretty significant enzyme in uh, methanogenesis, and it has sort of two active sites, and we can kind of see this diagram of this enzyme functioning here. So electrons from ferrodoxin are kind of funneled into this first active site here, which contains uh, tungsten, um, and then CO2 is reduced to formate in this first active site here. Uh, and then down in this uh, second active site, which contains zinc, is where we have conjugation of uh, the formal group to uh, methanofurin to form uh, formal methanofurin down here, this dehydrogenase. Okay, so kind of moving on with the pathway then, the third step in this pathway involves the transfer of this formal group uh, from methanofurin to another coenzyme, which is known as H4MPT, or tetrahydromethanopterin. So three, we have the transfer of this formal group from uh, methanofurin to H4MPT. And then in step four, we have conversion of the formal group to a methanol group. And this is catalyzed by a cyclohydrolase. And we'll kind of look a little bit more detail at um, the structure of this, this coenzyme H4MPT as well. So this is a chemical structure of tetrahydro uh, methanopterin. Um, it has a really similar chemical structure to um, tetrahydrofolate, which is probably a coenzyme that a lot of you are, are more familiar with. And actually the, the methyl groups that are shown in, in uh, blue here kind of indicate uh, how the structure of, uh, um, of the other coenzyme, uh, tetrahydrofolate, sorry. Um, and sort of significant in relation to this coenzyme, um, we have sort of the, the primary kind of active sites uh, or kind of the primary conjugation sites are kind of this N5 and this N10 site here within the coenzyme. So we can see if this is kind of a, a simplified structure of, of the coenzyme, <clears throat> we can see first the attachment of the formal group first is attached to this N5 site, um, and then through the function of this cyclohydrolase we form this methanol H4MPT, and then subsequently in the pathway, which we'll see in a minute, this methanol H4MPT is reduced to a methylene H4MPT, and then reduced again to a methyl H4MPT. And here's our methyl group here, which is attached to this N5 site within the coenzyme. Okay, so kind of moving on to steps five and six. So step five, as I kind of just said, is reduction of the methanol group to a methylene group within this, still bound to this coenzyme H4MPT. Uh, step six is then reduction of this methylene group to a methyl group. And so here we have a methyl group attached to H4MPT. And both of these re reduction reactions um, are catalyzed by dehydrogenases, which use a coenzyme, which is known as uh, F420. So we can quickly kind of look at the, the structure of this uh, coenzyme F420 as well. Kind of interestingly, uh, this coenzyme F420 is a, a flavin derivative, meaning that it's derived from riboflavin, which is a B vitamin. Um, so chem so uh, it's chemically or structurally similar to um, coenzymes such as um, flavin mononucleotide or flavin adenine dinucleotide, which which some of you have, have seen obviously before in previous courses. But kind of, I guess, significantly, this is the, the oxidized form of the coenzyme as, as well as the, the reduced form of this coenzyme F420 which is used in these reduction reactions. Okay, and then the final three steps of this pathway, seven, eight, and nine, is where we actually see methane uh, production. So in step seven, we have transfer of the methyl group from H4MPT to this coenzyme known as uh, coenzyme M. Um, and then in step eight, we have reduction of the methyl group within coenzyme M or methyl coenzyme M, reduction of this methyl group to um, 
methane um, by coenzyme B. And this also forms this um, mixed disulfide, which is shown here. And then the final step in the reaction is a final reduction reaction that reduces this mixed disulfide back to regenerate the reduced forms of this uh, coenzyme M and, and coenzyme B here. So this is known as the hydrogen, hydrogenotrophic pathway. And I guess we can look just a little bit at sort of the chemical structure of these coenzyme M and coenzyme B as well. So importantly, here's methyl coenzyme M, here's our methyl group, um, as well as coenzyme B. Uh, both of them contain a sulfhydryl or a thiol group. And so we have reduction of coenzyme M by coenzyme B forming this mixed disulfide here, uh, as well as methane, which is the product of this hydrogenotrophic pathway. Okay, so the, the second two um, methanogenesis pathways are, are simpler to cover because they're kind of derivatives of this initial hydrogenotrophic pathway. So the second one is known as the acetoclastic pathway. And in this case, we have a formation of methane from acetate. So the first step in this pathway is a formation of acetyl-CoA from acetate. So here's acetate and the formation of acetyl-CoA. This is uh, catalyzed by acetyl-CoA synthetase. And then the second step in this reaction is forming methyl H4-MPT. And this involves a transfer of a methyl group from uh, acetyl-CoA to H4-MPT, um, as well as oxidation of this carbon, which was our um, carboxyl group here within acetate, uh, to carbon dioxide. And then the last three steps of this pathway, sort of steps three and four and five, are really the same as the hydrogenotrophic pathway, where we have a transfer of this methyl group to coenzyme M, reduction of coenzyme M by coenzyme B, forming methane, as well as our mixed disulfide, and then reduction of the mixed disulfide to regenerate coenzyme M and coenzyme B by some sort of uh, reducing agent here. So this is known as the acetoclastic pathway, acetoclastic pathway, where we can produce methane from acetate. And then the final pathway um, for methanogenesis or, or methane production is um, the methylotrophic pathway. So in this case, we're producing methane from methanol, uh, as well as sort of similar C1 compounds. So in this case, we have the methyl group within methanol through the first reaction is transferred to coenzyme M. And this is cat catalyzed by some sort of uh, methyl transferase. And if this is a, a C1 compound other than methanol, then it's a different sort of methyl transferase that can then transfer this methyl group to, to feed into this pathway. And then the bottom section of this, this pathway is really the same as the cetoclastic pathway as well as the hydrogenotrophic pathway. So we have reduction of this methyl coenzyme M by coenzyme B forming methane. And then the final, as well as this mixed disulfide, and then the final step is reducing this mixed disulfide to kind of regenerate these two uh, coenzymes. But this bottom section of this pathway consumes two electrons to reduce uh, the mixed disulfide. And so these bacteria run sort of a combination of the bottom section of this pathway as well as uh, the top portion of this pathway, which we'll look at here. And the top portion of this pathway, which oxidizes uh, a methyl group to CO2, um, is really just the reverse of the hydrogenotrophic pathway. So in this case, we have a transfer of the methyl group to coenzyme M, and then oxidation of this methyl group to carbon dioxide. And this sequence of reactions here releases six electrons. And so th these uh, archaea, or these methanogens, can sort of produce methane as well as CO2 at a stoichiometry of sort of three to one to kind of release electrons to fuel this reduction here. So they produce both methane and CO2 through this methylotrophic pathway. Okay, so I think now that we've kind of looked at these three biochemical pathways for methane production, I think the sort of central question here, or the question thing that we want to sort of resolve is, is well, why do these methanogens uh, produce methane? 
And the answer is that uh, methanogenesis comprises uh, a variation or a type of anaerobic respiration. So it's a means that these archaea or these methanogens can use uh, to generate energy or to generate um, a gradient across a membrane to produce uh, ATP. So it's a version of um, anaerobic respiration. Methanogenesis is also thought to be a lot more diverse and complex and varied than most other types of respiration, such as oxidative phosphorylation um, or photosynthesis or some other types of anaerobic respiration. So we'll just look at one example here where um, we can see methanogenesis functioning as an electron transport chain. Okay, so if we look at this diagram here, we can see that we've got sort of a similar representation of this hydrogenotrophic pathway, um, but we can see that it's functioning as this electron transport chain. So if we have a CO2 kind of outside of these archaea, diffusing across the cytoplasmic membrane uh, into the cytoplasm, we can then have CO2 being uh, reduced to methyl coenzyme M here in the cytosol. And kind of importantly, the second step of this process, so um, the formation of uh, formal methanofurin, uh, consumes two protons within the cytoplasm. So then the second step of this process then would be reduction of this methyl coenzyme M by coenzyme B to form the mixed disulfide here in the cytoplasm. And then now we can kind of see where this electron transport chain sort of comes into play. So if we have oxidation of molecular hydrogen by a hydrogenase that's sort of membrane bound or transmembrane, producing two protons uh, outside of the archaea, we can have two electrons then transferred through this electron transport chain. So transferred through uh, cytochromes as well as MPH2, which is methanophenazine, which is a hydrophobic um, electron carrier that functions within these uh, methanogens. And then, so we can say that electrons are transferred between cytochromes as well as MPH2 to the reductase here. And then this reductase functions to reduce the heterodisulfide or the mixed disulfide to regenerate coenzyme B and coenzyme M. And so significantly, this functions, the system functions as an electron transport chain to generate a proton gradient across this cytoplasmic membrane. And so in this case, we had two protons consumed uh, to form uh, formal methanofuran. Uh, two protons are also consumed to reduce um, MPH2 and then also released uh, into the extracellular space or outside of the bacteria. And we also had two protons generated here through oxidation of molecular hydrogen by this hydrogenase, resulting in this proton gradient across uh, the cytoplasmic membrane. Okay, so I think what we want to do is just finish off the lecture by sort of reminding ourselves that the reason we're discussing um, the global methane cycle um, is because both carbon dioxide and methane function as very significant greenhouse gases. So as we can see on the top sort of graph here, uh, atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide have increased by almost 50% since pre-industrial times. So if we look at sort of pre-industrial times, so maybe the year 1750 here, carbon dioxide levels increased from about 280 parts per million up into around 410 or 410 parts per million today. And they've been increasing at a rate of approximately two parts per million per year. Um, and if we consider methane, we can see that in regards to methane, um, kind of that pre-industrial times here, sort of 1750, methane was present in the atmosphere at around 720 parts per billion. And it's increased by more than 150%. Um, the concentration of methane in the atmosphere now is about 1900 parts per billion. And so concentrations of methane are increasing at about eight parts per, this should be parts per billion uh, per year. And so although concentrations of methane are much lower in the atmosphere as compared to carbon dioxide, um, methane has a much higher global warming potential as compared to CO2. And so it's thought that currently uh, the overall contribution of methane to the greenhouse effect is somewhere in the range of kind of 10 to 15 percent. So a really significant greenhouse gas. Okay, so just to finish this lecture, 
The global methane cycle describes the flux of methane between various reservoirs on Earth. Methanogenic archaea, also known as methanogens, account for 70% of global methane emissions. The hydrogenotrophic, acetoclastic, and mephalotrophic pathways are the biochemical pathways that are used to produce methane. And atmospheric methane concentration have increased, concentrations have increased two and a half fold since pre-industrial times. And methane is considered the second most significant uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gas. Okay, thanks for watching. Bye.